Good morning, everyone. It's an honor to present the next talk. They will talk about the 5G hype, why it is justified or why not. So, I welcome our next two speakers. And yeah, we, I know it's uh, early in the morning, but uh, nevertheless, a uh, warm applause for Peter and Hurikus. Good morning. We are Hurikus and Peter, and I will, we will uh, tell you something about 5G. It's uh, everybody's talking about it. We need it absolutely, etc. But when uh, using the 5G, this uh, to yeah, this term, it's like uh, talking about uh, wood in, instead of talking about trees. And we want to um, speak about what is uh, possible with 5G and the 5G we are talking about today will be about the following. Yeah, I, tried, I drawed an overview about what we will uh, present today, the, the 5G that is already existing today. I will explain this in detail later. This is the network as it is at the moment. The black parts are the LTE networks, which already exists, and the orange parts are the new parts, which will uh, be added for 5G. You see mainly in the radio access there is a new 5G uh, part, which will be added, 5B and 5G and devices. And the important thing about the 5G, which already exists, it always coexists with 4G. It cannot be standalone. That's why it's also called 5G new uh, radio, non-standalone architecture. And they use the acronym NSA, <laughs> which is, yeah. I don't really like to say that. We, you have to get used to saying this. And while you are getting used to this uh, acronym, Peter will talk about the most important interface in uh, mobile communication, which is the air interface, the interface over the air. The 5G to 4G to 5G air interface. I will begin with 4G because um, 5G basically is a complicated 4G air interface. And I will begin with uh, how to get data on a radio interface. For this, you use a carrier, which uh, can you can usually turn on and off. And by turning it on and off, you change the amplitude and the phase. You can do it with uh, four different, yeah, with uh, different states uh, from QPSK, and then add more details to it to un until uh, 64 or 200, 265 QAM where you can uh, send 8 bits per symbol. So when I have a bunch of uh, carriers and subcarriers, the I have to feed them with data somehow. So the carrier will get a part of the data from a serial to parallel converter. But there's a problem with these subcarriers. When I have too many of them, or many of them, then they have um, free, uh, frequency ranges besides the actual carrier frequencies, which where there's also a power, a power in it. And this comes from turning, turning the carriers on and off by changing the, the phase and in 5G or 4G they are sent all at the same time so all these non-wanted yeah, parts of the frequencies are turned on and off at the same time. Time. And we choose the carriers uh, at the right, right direction so that the 
Next carrier is at the minimum of the adjacent carrier. carrier. In, uh, for instance, uh, we use OFDM, the subcarriers in, are in a distance of 15 kilohertz. This gives a simple time of 66.7 microseconds. So all 66.7 uh, microseconds, these uh, subcarriers are turned off and then they come again with uh, new information. That's basically the same with 5G. And but uh, we can also have other subcarrier uh, frequency bands. Okay, and then there is the symbol time. The symbol will take a certain time in the air, six, 66 microsecond macrocells. Will um, a, 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 a part of the signal will come by, via reception and a part via direct reception, and the guard period. The the end device will device uh, will ignore signals uh, during the guard period. For this transmission, we use OFDMA. UFDM has been around for a long time, it's Bluetooth or uh, Wi-Fi. However, all subcarriers are used for one uh, end device and um, only when that device has been served, the next device is served. OFDMA is Article Frequency Division Multiple Access, and um, so uh, guards are introduced and spaces and different clients are served. It's a little harder to calculate and to process than OFDM. OFDMA is more complex than that. And so OFDMA, when that is on the air and the number of subcarriers in LTE, with a 20 megahertz bandwidth, we have 1,200 subcarriers. If the client knows there is information within the subcarrier, all that signaling would take a lot of signaling. And so it's divided into resource blocks with 12 subcarriers over frequency and seven symbols. In LTE, that amounts to half a millisecond. In 5G, that is 12 subcarriers. However, with a 30 kilohertz subcarrier spacing, the block gets longer and the time shorter. We'll look at that in detail. Um, reference signals are a super thing. Um, uh, certain subcarriers serve peak out here in this um, complex of time frequency, this time frequency block, we have a third dimension. Reference signals, because of their position, where they are, carry the cell identifier number of E node B and G node B. And because of the power, the end device can, can measure how how strong the E node B is. Reference signals are um, sent with 15 to 18 dB power. That doesn't sound like a lot. However, the signals aren't alone. There's there's 1,200 uh, subcarriers in the LTE system. And, and a receiver uh, can be very... Uh, in, in GSM, <laughs> we have 150 kilohertz, 200 kilohertz bandwidth, and, and here it's 15 kilohertz, so they can be much more selective. We can also go down to 20 dBm sensibility for some reference signal. This is uh, several resource blocks chained, a resource grid from LTE, and in this uh, client state, 1.4 megahertz bandwidth, six resource blocks. You can recognize the resource blocks in different colors. Green is the broadcast channel. The few parameters are described. And this one exists not yet for 5G. 
because you don't know yet where to position it. It could be positioned anywhere. So the the synchrone, synchronous elements are orange and red. The gray area is for the client the open flow. So to search the data and the white areas for the resources that a client system shall be looking at. This now is a 20 megahertz system and 100 resource blocks. Here they are quite small, the resource blocks. The time that we put onto it is 10 milliseconds. So this is already LTE. In specific advanced standards, there is the possibility for multicast and public warning systems. But I have the feeling that LTE, LTE Advanced will now be overhauled by 5G. Yeah, you just have to build them in 5G. If I now take again a resource block, I can uh, calculate the maximum data speed. It has 84 elements. Four are always reference signals, so 80 remains for traffic. And if I modulate each of those subcarriers, I can. Each of these subcarriers can carry two to eight uh, data bits. <coughs> when using, for instance, the 64 QAM modulation, if you see, take one of these uh, rows with 12 subcarriers, then these are about 960 kilobits per second per subcarrier. So, this then times uh, 100, because I have uh, 100 of these resource blocks on top of each other, then I have uh, uh, expected, sp expected speed of about 96 megabits. It's let's, let's call it 100 megabit. And if we add MIMO, you cannot double the data rate, but approximately times 1.6. That's the approximate speed we can have in such a system. So in pr what is MIMO? MIMO, in principle, it is the um, transmission of several data streams at the same time on the same frequency but with uh, different, for instance, polarities or... And, uh, yeah, that's quite challenging because the end device can, can move. So about each uh, millisecond the channel is, is remeasured re and then it's uh, checked if you can do MIMO or not or which kind of MIMO. To use MIMO, you need several antennas. For instance, if you want to do four times MIMO, you need four antennas. And this uh, will add to about three to four times the data rate that you could normally achieve without MIMO. So now we did 4G, we have all basics to explain you 5G because we will do something with the resource blocks and sub carrier spaces. What's the problem? We only have 20 megahertz carrier bandwidth. We could uh, aggregate several uh, frequency bands, but uh, the maximum is 20 megahertz. We only have potato cell, I call them like that. If one client is uh, creating traffic, then the cell doesn't care where it is. The cells, the, the signals are sent in the entire cell, which leads to more interference with other systems. The idle to active time is always under 100 milliseconds. 
This means for a client, it always, always needs to sleep for some time. This, uh, this time means uh, the device can sleep for 99 milliseconds and uh, only one millisecond it has to get awake to, to check if something happens for, for it. With 5G we can change this time based on the new, new structure. 5G gives a lot of new possibilities. As I said, 5G is a complicated 4G. So it's might such that if somebody has a new idea, then you uh, have to find an end device uh, manufacturer who will uh, yes, do something with it. And I need a device manufacturer, I need a system manufacturer who implements the new feature. And I need, of course, a a network operator who would operate this feature. So that's the structure for 5G for a feature which don't exist yet at this point of, point of time. We have uh, a larger carrier bandwidth, up to 100 megahertz. We can use beam forming and more MIMO possibilities. And the idle to active time can be variable. If you want to do low latency stuff, then 100 milliseconds is too low. But uh, for some uh, temperature logger, this is uh, still more than enough. It, it can transmit once a day or so. So the, what are the frequency bands? These are the frequency bands that exist in Germany. We have uh, band 3, 7, 8 and 20. These are the classic LTE bands in Germany. And to increase the capacity of these bands, we, the band N78 will be added. Some of you might remember the auction, which will be yeah, available more and more to additionally. And we can do eight more fancy HF stuff with it. Higher frequencies with 5G, as I said, the subcarriers can be wider. If I make the subcarriers wider, however, um, they need to be tested. Um, so you may think that there's there are more resources per time. That's actually not right. I just marked it up in this space here. Um, the 15 kilohertz subcarrier uh, yields the yellow block uh, the, with a 30 second kilohertz subcarrier spacing. Um, uh, the bands are wider, but they are quicker sampli sampled. Um, you saw the resource grid for 4G that was that looked orderly. This is the resource grid for 5G. <coughs> Not quite as orderly. Um, it's really qu quite a bit more complicated. The pink blocks are the SSBs. The, we need them for the beams. We'll get to that. The blue blocks are the physical. It's the PDS, the shared channel, uh, or broadcast channel, can go there too. <laughs> it's uh, two beams that I am uh, showing here. It's relatively complicated, and it uh, could make it com more complicated still. If all the resources for multimedia broadcasts are in here, that would get more complicated. Um, or data for positioning over 5G, like GPS in-house based on 5G, etc., etc. So um, we're not going to go into that. We'll take a look at the data rate here. The data rate um, depends on the position of the client. The client has an end device, the end device has noise, um, you'll see the noise down here in the picture. And the lower the reception, the, the worse the um, SNR gets. To get a high data rate, I, get, I need a better SNR. Um, so ideally the end device is right in front of the antenna and I can do 256 QAM there. 
Um, however, the, a lot of errors are permissible and will be corrected uh, in parts over 50% of the data can be errors. Um, and uh, with larger distances, more error rates are permissible. So from that, you can calculate data rates. Um, I've tried here for different scenarios to calculate data rates. We, um, first of all, what you see is the orange block, 2.23 gigabits per second. That's the maximum you can get, in theory, get out of 5G in uh, N78 bands. If you do four times four MIMO and disregard any physical uh, laws. <laughs> um, there are some more realistic data rates. Um, first of all, we don't have um, 100 gigahertz in Germany, only 90. Uh, we can't do four times four MIMO everywhere. And so then we move into these yellow areas. Um, and the very last column, the two by two MIMO normal use and low traffic, uh, it means you share traffic with other customers. And we get into the range of about 500 megabits per second, which the customer can get or might get under certain conditions. Um, this is, this is um, a slide from Martin. Yeah, so <laughs> I've made a slide um, what this means in practice. Uh, Peter doesn't like speed tests, so I made this slide. Um, so what do we get? Um, so you said 2.23 gigabit per second in a 100 megahertz channel if everything is optimal. But 5G is never on its own. There's always LTE present too. And so even if everything aligns, um, you, um, you get another gigabit per second. What I've seen in practice, um, if you are pos optimally positioned, I get 1.3 to 1.4 gigabit per second um, from a channel plus LTE. However, that um, is not really a meaningful number. That was an empty cell. Um, this is the capacity that everyone has to share. And so to set this into relation, um, I've taken a look at what the Wi-Fi here at the Congress does. Um, right now it's about 3 gigabits per second with 10,000 devices connected. This is a channel that can do 1.3 gigabit per second, maybe not 10,000 channels. Um, but you get an indication where we're going with 5G. Not, not too bad. All right. So band N78, um, what do we do here? Um, we have a t time division DDD and FDD systems. FDD means that the uplink where the end devices are uses a different frequency domain than the downlink. So all bands all bands between 700 and 2.6 gigahertz are the 1500 band doesn't have an uplink. Um, an end device in this at this size can't can't send at 15 uh, gigahertz um, because it'll compete with the, G, uh, the GPS. TDD is band N78. Um, when we do T, uh, TDD, we uh, send and receive on the same frequency, just like DECT. Uh, the idea, however, is that if you do TDD, um, the resource downlink uplink uh, can be flexed. Um, if there's much downlink, there's less uplink and vice versa. All right. So. This would be a st such a structure, so we have only downlink slots, one special slot, and a, a little bit of uplink, so the whole thing is a little bit a lot of specifications how this distribution of downlinks and uplinks could be made, so you could think we could uh, share the traffic dynamics, but no, because we don't have only one provider in the country, so there are several. 
So this is now difficult if I have several antennas on one tower because they are on different frequencies, but they are very close. So if one antenna is sending and the other one is receiving a few megahertz below or above, the sending would be would be uh, disturbing the receiving of the antenna. So it is important that all the providers in N78 use the exactly same structure of uplinks and downlinks. So the station must be have a GPS added. So the providers have to actually talk to each other. They can't do whatever they want. So with the clients, it's a similar case. So if the orange client is sending, then the uh, green one could not be receiving at the same time if they are lying on the same table. So this is a 5G antenna. There are few. Um, there is no IP. There is a this is a specific um, protocol. These are several antennas. The round uh, items are the small antennas, and there are also receivers on it, so that the phases can be uh, activated. So now, how does this beaming work now? So that it beams in a certain direction and receives from a certain direction? I can do this with phase redirections. So you usually work with different cable lengths, but... So there's a split. Yes, so there is a, a, a radio field that has a certain direction. But the phasen redirector already sits within the element here. So here you can see the beams. This is a synchronization signal block, SSB. This is in this N78 band in the middle. It contains a few elements. So I will take several SSB blocks for a beam that variate in the phases. So it's like a light, uh, like a light tower that beams in uh, through the area with different SSB blocks, and the beams have different um, strengths. So after two milliseconds, two milliseconds, eight beams have been sent, and the client can actually receive those and initiate a connection. And this is now the connection establishment in the air. So the G node B says, I take a traffic beam that uh, lights into this direction, and I offer you a few more traffic beams, so you, the client, in this same phase area, and you tell me which of those traffic beams you can best receive. So the client is actually reporting back to the antenna which of the beams is the best for the client. So we are in the same cell. So the senders and receivers just change their phases. So you can do actually 2x2 two two or 4x4 four four MIMO with this setup and you just use different channels. So it's quite orderly in this cell with these different beams. So the traffic is only there where actually is a target. 
there is no further interference um, in the field. So, so I can directly um, provide good quality to customers. So there are f further MIMO antenna with a, with a cable. So you have to measure the phases so you, and you have to correct it. So the phase coupler makes a back coupling to measure the phases of the different cables. And with 5G, there is then a single user MIMO possible. So one user gets data from different antenna areas. With one, one channel is used for one uh, client, the other channel is used for a second client. And this works in the uplink and in the downlink. So, with uh, how can you measure 5G antennas? Um, we can use passive antennas to use uh, normal antenna measurements, but this is more difficult with uh, active antennas because we would have to open the anten ten entire antenna thing and check each antenna element, check if it's still there, if it uh, is maybe got wet or etc. That's something that uh, a system, the technician would have to do, it's not that trivial. But I can do high, like um, high level measurements as long as long as the static beams are still working as they should, I assume that the uh, Antenna is more or less okay. Now let's talk about uh, not physical properties anymore. Let's talk about the network architecture. So I made some slides about uh, a net network, how it works. You see the slide with this NOSTI NSA abbreviation uh, acronym. You see all the components which are inside a 5G network. The black components are already there for LTE and the orange ones are the new components which already exist more or less until today for 5G. And in the future, all black components should be replaced by 5G components. In the middle of the slide, there is the core network, which is divided in two uh, parts, logically. One part transports uh, user data, payload, which is uh, connected to the Internet. This is done via gate gateways. It's done with uh, usual router, as you know, you know them, the software is a bit special, but uh, yeah, it's basically IT, IP, and you have also the management uh, stuff on the other, on the other side, which has, for instance, a subscription database where any uh, subscription, each client has an entry, um, each uh, each customer has uh, cipher keys, uh, etc. So everything is uh, based on IP in these days. So in the end, we have only one. We need only one cable which transports all these data to to the HSS. Uh, we have only one cable to a mobile antenna. So the there are about 20,000 antenna elements, but core elements, we don't need that money. For 5G, you know the 4GE Note B plus also the 5G Note B, 5G G Note B, but they always work together. The LTE, tile is, LTE part is always the master and the 5G part is added as a speed booster only. This is what I call uh, what is called the uh, non standalone architecture. You don't have to, yeah, we don't have standalone 5G networks. It's something that was done because it was easier in these days to implement it like, like this. 
Usually we also need uh, better, I, I call the radio space stations because it's called like this in GSM. And we also need better uh, links from the core network to, to these uh, base stations. In these days we usually have gigabit fiber connections, but in 5G we might have bigger data rates. So in theory we have three sectors, we have three times the data rate, and we need about 10 gigabit links. In these days the uh, state of the art is uh, 10 gigabits. You have to exchange the transceivers, the fiber stays the same. All right, so here's a couple of flow diagrams, what happening, what's happening in the network when a 5G connection is established from uh, plane mode, from flight mode. Looks complicated. Um, might be, uh, well, actually, but uh, all of this happens with under 100 milliseconds. On the left-hand side, there's the user equipment, which is the end device, the smartphone, whatever. You know, B is the 4G base station. The MME is the mobility management entity in the core network. The HSS database and the gateways on the right-hand side, which transport uh, payload. So exiting the flight mode, even with the 5G end device, we do the 4G part of the procedure. It searches the broadcast information of nearby stations, searches for the best station, then goes through a random access procedure because with LG, the LTE and 5G um, things work differently than from Wi-Fi where in Wi-Fi everyone just checks whether they can send. Here, here it's very clear who can send and who may receive at any one time. Uh, end devices cannot just send and receive at random. There is a access procedure. The end device uh, says, hey, I need a channel to tell you where I am and who I am. That's the RSC connection setup procedure. An attached request is sent. Um, this contains, all right, I'm end device with number so and so. I'd like to have internet access. Um, the 4G base station um, pass, passes this to the MME, uh, which uh, looks up a record in the database, then starts the authentication and suffering procedure. Um, so first authenticates the device, where it actually is the device it claims to be, um, and then uh, ciphering is switched on such that uh, at least trivial eavesdropping attempts aren't possible. While all this is happening, uh, the, the location of the end device is being passed to and written into the database, um, or at least um, a rough area. Um, because if later on to save battery life, I take away the channel, the network still needs to remember where I am, so the rough location is um, now put in the database. Now, while this is happening, on the left-hand side, the capabilities are exchanged, the uh, end device capabilities, depending on the age of the end device. Um, it might be capable of less or more. This information isn't uh, just kept in the base station in E node B, but also in the MME. Um, depending on how many carriers can be bundled, what modulation schemes are possible, um, uh, the uh, highest data rate varies. Um, the bottom part, um, the MME acquires an IP address from the uh, PDN gateway. The PDN gateway accesses the internet. Usually you get a private IPv4 address. Um, with NAT, NAT of course isn't so great, but in the mobile network that's not too bad because at least you keep the script keys out that, that will uh, drain your battery. Um, and finally, the MME will send back the initial context setup a request containing the IP address, which is then passed on to the end device, and a so-called default bearer is um, initiated. Seen from the smartphone, it looks like a logical network interface. So an Android IF config might show you how a new IP interface has just been put into existence. There can be several of these on an end device. Um, for the default bearer, that there's a default bearer specifically for the telephone stuff. Um, that's a different interface from the IP. Um, and finally, the payload can flow. Um, also, 
a measurement config is sent um, so that when the signal power drops, uh, the network can decide and do a handover. All of this in 100 milliseconds. So this was the 4G part only. Now we get to 5G. Um, so when the 4G base station uh, notices this is actually a 5G device and I have a 5G cell, uh, it takes the 5G G node B in addition. Um, so then measurements are done on the 5G frequencies, um, the end device does that, uh, that goes back to the 5G G node B and uh, it'll take the IP data stream over uh, and tell the 4G E node B that a switch can be done, a switch over can be done. And then uh, you will get your data by both the 4G and the 5G node Bs. And that's why the, the bottom blue arrow is wider than the upper one. The simultaneous reception of 4G and 5G is called simultaneous bearer um, because my packets come from both node Bs. Um, the 5G G node B simply splits the packets. Most of it, it transmits itself and the rest uh, goes via the X2 interface to the 4G card, uh, which uses the LTE. Um, to transmit and the end device will then recombine the packets um, in the end device. In uplink, uh, we are not doing this as a practical matter. Everything is being transmitted in LTE, so end device to network um, is doing everything with LTE, or one could do 5G as well. However, advantage of LTE is it's a lower frequency, and so the reach is higher, the reach is better. However, you need to then um, share the channel with others. If you do everything in 5G, um, you might have the channel for yourself because there's not so many end devices, but however, um, the reach is not as, as good. And so if you um, are too far from the base station, the network will reconfigure and use LTE for the uplink. And uh, you can do both. Uh, what, you know, it depends. With the uplink, that using only 4G or 5G, that's actually only half true because there's uh, acknowledgements on lower layers for uh, the data packets that I get. Um, you know, download data packets sent uplink uh, acknowledgements. For this to happen quickly, um, without um, data loss, and you have to do this for both 4G and 5G because you, you got the data via split bearer. Um, so your your payload might go just to 4G, but however, acknowledgements have to go via both networks. And the problem is you only have one budget for transmission power and now you have trans two transmitters and so each transmitter only gets half of the available power that will limit your reach. So, so <laughs> this is the story about how, when do I actually show a 5G logo? This is more complex as with 3G, 4G, LTE, etc. You know, the end device would usually know which network it's in. With 5G, 5G is only the speed booster. And if you do it just so, the, the 4G and 5G might just switch back and forth on the display. It could be confusing. And so the idea was that um, LTE has system information, there's a, there's a bit in the system information called upper layer indication, uh, just so you don't know what it's for. And the upper layer indication bit, if that is set, it means there is also a 5G cell sending and the end device, um, if, it, if it hasn't been told it, it must not access 5G, that's the access restricted bit, um, it can then use that bit and display the 5G logo, even though the 5G part may actually not be active. Um, and so the advantage then is um, the, whether the 5G part is there and, and is active or not, it doesn't matter. You don't toggle all the time. Then there is a handover scenarios 
if you have 4G and 5G, they have to be there at the same time, but the scheduler is uh, totally independent from each other. So if I do a handover from uh, step one to step two, it can happen depending on the infrastructure that you first switch to the uh, 5G uh, part and the 4G part still remains on the old station. So I will receive uh, my data from two different cells. So my data, I receive my data from two different directions. So if only if my client then uh, acknowledges that the 4G can also be reached on the new uh, cell, the data will come actually both uh, from the same cell. Then I have here a picture for the perspective, future perspective. So because of the 3.4 gigabytes hertz that have only a certain range, we have to increase. So how do we do that? So do we just remove LTE and put in 5G? So this is good for the guys with new 5G devices, but the ones with old devices have a problem then. So uh, another possibility to solve this, how the Swisscom is doing it, is called dynamic spectrum sharing. So the idea is to configure 5G in the same way as 4G, to have 5G and 4G in the same channel. I will then need two control channels. So the yellow one for 5G, for 4G and the blue one for 5G. So the clients can then be assigned in the different control channels. So, depending on the number of end devices for 5G and 4G, I can split my channel. The disadvantage is that I now need two control channels, which costs bandwidth, which costs uh, 10 to 15 percent capacity. So this is a real disadvantage only to have 5G and 4G at the same time. So it seems that the first scenario might be chosen. So if I then have 5G in the lower bands to make it also available outside of cities, so we will not just throw away the 4G core network, but we will... Um, operate them both, so 5G and 4G, at the same time for a certain amount of years. So also the clients will then still use the 4G network and only move slowly to the 5G core network. So you again have the two areas, the user plane, so the routers and then the mobility entity has been split into two functions, so access management function and session management function. And the database has been split actually in three blocks. This has been done um, because LTE originally thought that one entity is one hardware box, but now virtualization also has reached the telecom providers. So for the 5G core network, the telecom providers want to virtualize. So there are no hardware entities anymore, but functions now, and that's why this has been split up. 
bin ich eigentlich schon fast durch. So now we are nearly at the end. Uh, I have a nice slide here. The good thing for 4G, 5G, all the specifications are public. You don't have to uh, subscribe to anything. You can just access them and download the specifications from there. We have put on all the slides, we have put references from the specifications, so, so you can easily find those references in the publicly available specifications. So now we are finished. Thanks very much for listening. Und ja, viel Spaß beim Kongress noch. Ja, haben wir noch Zeit für Fragen. And have fun and now time for questions. Ich muss das Mikro auch anschalten, damit was rauskommt. Ähm, so, genau, wir haben jetzt noch etwa 10 Minuten. So, we have about 10 minutes for questions. If you are in the hall, then come to one of the mics. Uh, but we begin with the signal angel. Question from the internet. How far should the clients be away apart from each other so they don't interfere with each other? Answer, one to two meters, but this case won't uh, happen because all network operators will uh, operate with a constant schematic scheme. You, yeah, don't, don't think about it, it won't be a problem. On my desk there are usually four to five anti-devices, so one meter would not be feasible, but as you said, they don't uh, interfere with each other, but as it's, of course, better to put them uh, a bit apart from each other. Next question. Uh, the signal strength below 6 GHz is about 20 dBm. So the question is about uh, about health issues with millimeter waves and uh, on millimeter waves. So is it? <coughs> yeah, can we deploy it actually? <laughs> we always wear our 5G amulet. Uh, nothing can happen to us. So <laughs> just to be entirely sure. Now, um, the regulations, there are regulations, uh, maximum values with maximum transmission values, and these are regulated up to the terahertz uh, range, and the rest is more like a religion, and you, you can... Yeah, people, people fear things that they don't know, and other people can want to make money with it. And it's it's a difficult question. It's more like a religious, religious question. Short edition. Yeah, you said. You said. We talked about the sub six gigahertz range because this is what's actually rolled out right now. But uh, there's also the millimeter wave uh, thing in 5G. Where, for instance, uh, 30 gigahertz. This is done in the US, but the big problem is that the range is very limited. So, just by having a hand in front of the device or having a wall in between, you have serious reception problems. So, nobody really began to do something with the meter waves and people in Europe are still uh, waiting um, to see the experience from uh, the US. Okay, microphone four, please. So, so what, what are the maximum physical speeds that end devices can move at in 5G? Well, so my, my example is uh, um, <laughs> if you take the train in other countries, uh, 4G works. It's, it's the same with 5G. If you use a Thales train uh, from, fr from Paris to train, you have 300 uh, kilometers per second and you still get your data right through. Uh, it's not a problem. Um, works with 300 kilometers per hour. There's certain parameters to make the network robust against Doppler shift. 
um, and also robust against jitter. These parameters um, are f relevant for the entire cell and so um, downgrade the performance for the entire cell. Um, however, trains not a problem to up to f speeds of 400 kilometers per hour. <laughs> yeah, 400 kilometers per hour still works. Um, so, pl airplanes actually, aircraft use LTE, 500 kilometers per hour still work. All right. Signal Angel question from the internet, please. The internet wants to know. Um, about the authentication of base stations ag uh, against e, uh, e Node B. So if you have a base station, um, how can you authenticate with the base station if you if you get one, get a hold of one? Well, there's some partial answers. Usually what you do is you build a VPN tunnel between the uh, base station and the core network. So that certainly has an authentication. And then the MME and the base station will also authenticate with each other. I don't have the details of that, however. Do you know? Uh, okay. So a VPN tunnel first, and then after that, everything is scripted. So the authentication of the network um, against the end device, was that the question? No, no, no. It, the question is that having the base station. Um, so if you, if you bring your own base station, <laughs> someone who's like the, the big attacker, the, the bad guy. Yeah, well, so sure, you could do that. However, there's some barriers in place. That's political. So uh, what, what we're showing here is the standard um, why there's no authentication or the authentication itself, that's politics. All right, let's take microphone seven, please. So what I would like to know is that over a long time, 4G and uh, 5G will be um, simultaneously operated. Why shouldn't we also use 3G at the same time uh, we have so this and also what you said is that all operators of 5G networks need to be synchronized in their frame structure so for me as a layman that's like why that's unnecessary overhead that, that will um, cost performance I'm going to take the first part of that. Um, the lower frequencies, the UMTS frequencies are already at 2.1 gigahertz. Um, so when I said the lower frequencies, that of course means the UMTS frequencies too. However, even UMTS frequencies have limited reach. Um, so if I go to lower bands, like band 20, that's 800 megahertz. Um, or 1800 megahertz or 900 megahertz. Um, over long time, 5G will have to move there too. And of course, also in 2.1 gigahertz. Uh, it might just be easier in 2.1 gigahertz because 3G, not so many people are using. So the second question, why do they need to be synchronized? Well, it's simply a technical requirement. Um, frequencies in the 3.6 gigahertz space are very closely spaced, and that's just technology. If I sell frequency space to operators, they they will have to synchronize. That's that's uh, that's the limits. Okay. okay. Lower frequency. Lower frequencies don't give you any miracle speeds. I mean, you, you'll see it in the slides, the, the speeds uh, for 5G, 10 megahertz carriers, even 700 megahertz, might be 1.3 uh, uh, speed improvement. Okay, two more minutes. Uh, one short question, please. My question is, how do private 5G networks work? Um, do they also use a mixture of 5G and 5, 4G, or is it just 5G? Well, there's 500 megahertz that have been reserved. When we talk about f private networks, um, that's like a campus network or a, a, a plant, an industrial plant. So you don't have to 
do a mix, a 4G, 5G mix, you can just do a 5G um, as well. Okay, one. Hello. Hi. Uh, how much energy does all the, uh, the signal processing need just without the radio? So what's the <laughs> what's the power draw of the base station? Well, that's difficult. Um, yeah, you can you can take a look at the internet. That question comes up a lot. So what the antenna sends in a 20 megahertz band, it's 20 watts or 40 watts or maybe 100 watts, and you have three sectors. But a base station, everything together, that's three to four kilowatts uh, that that it needs. So the the actual energy transmitted is the smaller part of the energy that's used. All right, we're at the end. Send in your questions online. Thank you. Thanks for listening for the English translation of from.